Action Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Listen to AM560, The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. You know, on the Twitter files, there's a lot of things that were unearthed we haven't even gotten to yet because we've been so focused on the, you know, the key topics of the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story and the uh, shadow banning or outright uh, or the, the visibility um, m- massaging of conservative talkers and so forth, the banning of Donald Trump and a uh, Twitter tweeter named Avid Halaby tweeted out a very interesting thread that provides a lot of detail that suggests that the internal controls at Twitter under Dorsey and then Argawal were arguably slightly better than FTX. He starts, the stuff uncovered in the Twitter whistleblower report is much crazier than anything in the Twitter files, but it's much less politically, tribally salient, so it got no attention. There's whistleblower report versus the you know files that are being funneled through uh, journalists like Taibbi and Barry Weiss and Michael Schellenberger. Twitter didn't monitor employee computers at all. It wasn't uncommon for employees to install spyware on work devices. Twitter does not have separate development, test staging, and production environments. At least 5,000 employees had privileged access to production systems. And he's got the excerpts from, I'll retweet, he's got the excerpts from the uh, whistleblower report here to substantiate the summary. In 2020, Twitter had security incidents serious enough that they had to be reported to the federal government on an almost weekly basis. And meanwhile, uh, Parag Agarwal was lying about how secure Twitter was. On January 6th, the whistleblower wanted to take action to prevent potential sabotage by a rogue employee. He learned it was not possible for Twitter to secure its production environment. The whistleblower realized that a data center failure could potentially cause the permanent loss of all Twitter's data. He shared this fact with senior leadership who instructed him not to put it in writing to the board. A few months later, the exact eventuality almost came true and only a Herculean effort by Twitter engineers prevented quote, permanent irreparable failure, unquote. Twitter had no software development life cycle, life cycle and mi- misled both the FTC and its board about this fact for a decade. This whistleblower informed the previous CEO, Argwal, that there were thousands of failed login attempts to Twitter's engineering system every day, and he, the CEO did nothing. Twitter did not keep backups of employee computers. They used to, but then the system broke, was never fixed, and execs decided this was good because it meant they couldn't comply with regulators. And so on and so forth. It's just one sort of uh, example of corporate malfeasance after another. I just find, you know, find this interesting as since, since under those CEOs and all of the blue check leftist mafia types, this was the portal through which democracy was going to be protected. For more on all of this, the Twitter files related and whistleblower report, since I've raised it, pleased to be joined again by James Bovard, member of the USA Today Board of Contributors, author of Lost Rights and nine other books. James, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me back on the show. Um, you had, I mean, if you want to comment on the uh, the sort of corporate governance and day to day management of the of Twitter, I, I think that's as interesting too. And I'm surprised Elon Musk isn't saying more about this. But it's like what I inherited and why these people needed to go just on the basis of sort of systems and work performance. Yeah, it sounds like a very interesting story. I'm learning about it as I listened to you this morning. Okay. Um, well, uh, this is a topic of uh, additional thought and consideration that we'll explore. Um, you took up another angle from the Twitter files that has been underreported as we were as we we're all talking about those top line matters that I I previously mentioned. And that's the impact that uh, Twitter's content moderation policies, as they call them, had on mail and ballots and thus the 2020 election. 
Yeah, there was a huge effort uh, by the uh, Department of Homeland Security, a new agency that had been created as part of that DHS in 2018, gave grants to a bunch of uh, 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 nonprofits and uh, com- uh, um, uh, companies tied to universities, uh, who, who then basically carried out the federal orders to pressure social media to suppress any criticism of mail-in ballots from mid-2020 onwards, and uh, because that was their number one target. I think they understood that if Biden was going to win, it was going to be because of a massive number of mail-in ballots, which was the case. Almost two-thirds of uh, Biden's votes came from absentee or mail-in ballots. And so you had these these federal contractors pressuring social media, Twitter, Facebook, and other places to basically suppress any criticism of mail-in ballots. I mean, and part of the paradox here is if you just uh, turn back the clock to before 2000, uh, 2020, there were all kinds of controversies about uh, mail-in ballots. The New York Times had said that mail-in ballots were a far greater source of fraud than the uh, than voting in person, uh, there was a federal commission co-chaired by Jimmy Carter in 2005, said the same thing. All these bright red warning uh, uh, signs about mail-in ballots and fraud, but all those signs magically vanished in uh, mid late 2020 when uh, those ballots gave Biden the presidency. Yeah, that that's uh, a key point you make here too. Just going back uh, the record, and you know it used to be well understood because it sort of stands to reason you don't need to be an expert in election administration to understand that there are more fraud opportunities with absentee and mail-in ballots than with a physical person in front of you voting and and so and that that played itself out um and you remind us and you remind us number one that you weren't allowed to say what the new york times reported a decade earlier and and as you say these commissions had concluded and so forth that was all washed away And um, we need to be reminded about how many ballots were not counted, spoiled uh, in swing states like Nevada and Wisconsin in 2020. Yeah, and there were all kinds of rule changes that were unconstitutional, which basically lowered the standards for verifying those absentee ballots. You had the Secretary of State of Michigan, on her own authority, send out 7 million absentee ballots to every voter in the state, the the, the uh, it's clear in the U.S. Constitution that the laws for that the uh, procedures for federal elections need to be uh, um, um, uh, set by the state legislature. So, but throughout in a number of states, uh, those uh, the uh, election rules were set by uh, a bunch of judges or a bunch of political appointees or just by string polling, and uh, it, it was a violation of the Constitution. There was. A big push to have the Supreme Court issue a clear ruling on that didn't happen. So we might be seeing the same kind of uh, fierce controversies uh, for the 2024 election. But this is also tainted because you've had Biden out there screaming Jim Crow 2.0. Right. Any time that uh, some state tries to make, uh, you know, have a little bit higher standards to verify the ballots. Right. No. And even Raphael Warnock essentially repeated the same claim after his on his uh, uh, during his victory speech on uh, election night in the runoff just last week. I mean, just just because I won doesn't mean that voters aren't there's not still voter suppression afoot by Brian Kemp and the Republicans and and the Donald Trump Republicans and so on and so forth. And so these are this is the way we're going to save our democracy by making our uh, elections demonstrably less well, secure and honest. Uh, and accurate. Honest. How about honest? How about we go with honest. the word honest? honest. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there were so many scams that have been done. I mean, ballot harvesting has become prevalent, and so you have people going door to door and just asking people to sign the top line. You know, uh, um, just to sign the top line, say you're voting for Biden. There, uh, don't worry about the rest of the ballot. We'll just put this back in the bag. Thanks. There's, uh, you Here's know, a chain cookie. of custody. Yeah. A chain of custody of ballots has been completely disregarded, and it's almost like every ballot supposed to be uh, supposed to be treated like it's uh, handed down from Mount Sinai. But you know, this isn't how the game works, even in Chicago. <laughs> well, here's the concern that uh, I have too, because after what happened at the midterms, you've got a lot of calls from Republicans to, you know, hey, look, 
the vote by mail. It's a real thing. Those are the rules of the game. We got to play by the rules of the game in the states where they have, you know, six months of early voting and 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 ballots being distributed willy nilly everywhere. So that's the rules of the game. So we got to do the same thing the Democrats are doing, essentially, is the argument. And, you know, it's persuasive. And I understand why the rules of the game. So, yeah, you got to maximize your opportunity to win according to the rules of the game. But. Where do those rules of the game, you know, somebody's got to think, where is that ultimately going to put us? How, how does this end well if this is a contest to see who can engage in dishonesty the most effectively? Absolutely. I mean, it's it, um, it's so sad to see a lot of the standards that had been um, developed over half a century or a century to have honest elections have been just completely thrown out the uh, thrown out the window, starting with covid and now you got Biden, a lot of the Democrats trying to make a lot of those changes permanent. But it, it doesn't matter how many extra people vote if the um, if the votes are fabricated. And, and and at the federal level, I mean, you you don't want to throw out the standard there and say, well, like like the left attempted to do, but didn't have the votes to eliminate the filibuster they wanted in the Senate to federalize elections to just essentially strip the power away from the states. Now they're trying to do the same. Uh, in the Supreme Court with that North Carolina gerrymandering case. But but you don't want to do that either because you want federalism. You want decentralization. You want elections to be state and local matters. So then you're left in this sort of nether space. We don't want the federal government to do a takeover. Um, we want things to be uh, run as honestly as possible. We don't want outside money funding private uh, pri private money funding, you know, public election administration offices like we had with Zuckerbucks. Um, but so what do we do about Wisconsin and Arizona and Nevada and some of these other states that uh, on, on which federal national elections turn that have so many questions surrounding their the election administration? Pennsylvania, throw that in, too. Yeah, there, there's so many controversies, so many scandals. It's frustrating that most of the media has had very little curiosity about the nuts and bolts of the changes that have been done for elections. Uh, they've made it much shakier as, as far as far as results. Uh, and this is the same media, much of the same media that was happy to howl for three years about how Trump was uh, you, you know, a Russian tool based on false allegations in 2016. So it's just, it, it's hard to see a happy ending for the way things are going. Yeah, yeah. He is James Bovard, member of the USA Today Board of Contributors, author of Lost Rights and nine other books. Uh, do check out his column we were uh, discussing on the Twitter files and the impact uh, or, or the description, what they reveal about how uh, mail and ballots have become sacred uh, now just after one or now two cycles. Jim Bovard, thanks as always for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And he joined us on the Turnkey.pro answer line. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal.